Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos. And today, I want to talk to you about a Logos movie review, a recent watching of The Island. This is a Russian film, a Russian Orthodox film. This is a film that's been recommended to me to watch for a while, and I haven't got around to it. And uh, due to the suggestion of Diana, she knows who she is, uh, that was what I did for today's stream. I decided to go ahead and watch this film. Multiple people said, you need to watch The Island. And I typically am not the biggest movie watcher, generally speaking. So while most of my friends are like avid movie watchers or TV shows, uh, people who know me uh, know that I usually am not privy to what's happening in regards to uh, films or pop cultural stuff in regards to again, movies or Hollywood or anything like that. Now, this is not from Hollywood. This is actually a Russian film, and it's Orthodox-themed, and it was a very, very, very good movie. So uh, today, I want to go over, so if you haven't watched it, you know, this stream's going to be filled with spoilers, all right? So spoiler alert to get right off the bat here. Um, we'll be going over much of the film and talking about specific scenes and unpacking some of the things that I think are really important and things that we can discuss and maybe learn from. And so some of the takeaways that I want to talk about today, we'll be getting into like God's providence. I want to talk to you guys about unlikely messengers. Uh, I want to talk to you guys about how this unlikely messenger and God's providence, how this relates to even this, this YouTube channel or what people refer to as my ministry. But I want to kind of get open and honest about uh, some of the struggles that I deal with and my heart regarding what I try to do online in this sort of interesting paradox or conflict uh, that maybe some of you guys aren't aware of that, again, I'm going to highlight regarding... Uh, in light of things happening in this film. And then I want to talk about uh, allowing God's timing to work. Again, this is going to be related to some of the scenes happening in this film. And then I want to get into being a fool for Christ. What is a fool for Christ? And so some of you guys may be familiar with this phraseology, uh, this term about a fool for Christ, somebody who normally transgresses societal norms, societal boundaries, for religious purposes. And so in the sense of being perceived as foolish or crazy, we have many saints, we have many figures in orthodoxy um, who were, quote-unquote, fools for Christ. And so one, I want to unpack that in regards to specifically what that means. And so we'll be reading or discussing a little bit about the fool for Christ archetype, if you will. But also, some of you may be familiar with what's called a trickster figure. And so if you look into indigenous traditions, indigenous mythology, um, obviously within an animistic worldview, there's the trickster figure is often the coyote. Uh, again, it can be perceived in different ways. But for Native Americans, um, the coyote was the trickster figure. Again, we got Wiley Coyote, if you're familiar with the coyote and the road, one, road runner. <clears throat> And so that has a actually deeper meaning and that the coyote, its wiliness, was considered to be a trickster figure. And so the trickster figure is also animated in regards to the tribal society as the joker, um, the, ver the person who inverts things. And so I want to talk about how the fool for Christ is a sort of trickster figure that's been Christianized. It's been Christianized. So it doesn't do some of the more sinful, lewd activities you might see in a tribal setting of the trickster figure, somebody who deliberately maybe once a, once a year or a few times a year just uh, dramatically transgresses the, the tribal norms, the tribal boundaries. And this is a way for the trickster figure to highlight new ideas or, or truths that aren't usually presented because of the societal norms maybe overshadowing them and the day-to-day -day activity. So I want to talk a little bit about the fool for Christ, and then I want to talk about the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer plays a prominent role in the movie The Island, and I also want to speak to a recent experience I had using the Jesus prayer. And so today's going to be mixed with, <clears throat> again, talking about and reviewing this movie, 
but also me referencing back to my own journey, uh, this Orthodox journey, this journey with Christ, and how uh, my life or my journey has been changing in different states and different stages. So that's what I want to talk to you guys about. Again, for those of you just joined, we will be highlighting uh, specific scenes in the movie. So if you haven't seen the movie, spoiler alert right now, spoiler alert right now. This isn't going to be a very long stream because at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, in basically an hour and 15 minutes, I have my church, sort of like a theology study. So every Wednesday night, Subdeacon Mark, as I'm sure you guys know who he is, our beloved Subdeacon Mark, actually leads a group, a Zoom meeting at our church, and I'm, I always send that out. I kind of help aid with the online activity of our parish, and every Wednesday night, uh, he leads us and a theology course. And so we're currently reading this book right here. I don't know if you guys have read it. It's called The Hymn of Entry. It's a very, very good book. And so I have to get off here before seven o'clock so I can join the church's class so we can uh, do our two-hour theology course we do every Wednesday night. And then Sundays after liturgy, we also do a two-hour Bible study. We do a two-hour Bible study with the church, also led by Subdeacon Mark. So um, so again, this stream's not going to be a three-hour long stream or anything like that. It's probably just going to be a little bit over an hour. But with that being said, let me do a quick housekeeping, and then we'll just dive into the content for today's stream. Uh, first, I want to say, please smash that like if you guys are here. And I want to give a special thank you to everyone who has gone over to the website and become website members. Now, there's two new videos up over at the website. If you guys would like to check those out, um, I will be posting another new video on the website this week. So there will be another new video this week you can expect up. Uh, for those who are members, again, you can just log in and, and check that out. For those of you who would like to become members, check out the link in the live chat right now. You can click that. And for $5 a month, you can get access to exclusive content. The real point is if you'd like to support Church of the Eternal Logos, become a website member. It's only $5. Again, you don't have to super chat all the time or unless you feel called. But um, it's a great way to support, and you'll have access to a, a growing video library, right? It's a value that only increases in value. So if that'd be something that you would like, um, <clears throat> please do that. Um, and then also, if you guys would be interested in, in signing up for a one-on-one -on -one session, if you'd be wanting to talk about theology, philosophy, mythology, uh, goal setting, fitness, whatever you'd like to talk about, uh, you can go to the website and purchase a one-on-one -on -one session. And again, if anybody who has done a one-on-one -on -one session, please maybe highlight uh, your experience there in the live chat. You guys are usually the best salesman of that uh, that feature. So if you could do that, that'd be great. Also, we have, again, uh, merchandise and stuff like that over at the website. So if you'd like to check out some of our uh, Church of the Eternal Logos merchandise, some of the merch, we got the Arabic uh, Lord's Prayer shirt. We have the Calvary Cross shirt. We have the um, <clears throat> Got Church uh, original design shirt. So again, if you just like to mosey on over there and see what we got. We do have some merch over at the website. So that kind of handles our housekeeping. <clears throat> so now we can get into today's movie review. So before I go through again scene by scene and kind of talk about and unpack this movie, I do want to highlight... Um, <clears throat> Well, I was just going to show you guys the trailer. Let's just do that first. Let's just watch the trailer, and then we'll watch the trailer, and then I'll talk a little bit about the movie itself. So here, wa let's watch the trailer. Again, it's in Russian, so you're going to have to read. This is a Russian Orthodox film, so you're going to have to read some subtitles. You know, It's not going to be a, 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 a passive activity. It's going to be a little bit more active to watch this movie, but I am guarantee you it is absolutely worth it. And so let's just watch the trailer real quick and then uh, I will read to you guys a little bit about about this film so let me make that a little bit smaller <clears throat> Когда-то его спасла от смерти невыносимая боль. 
теперь ему дана вторая жизнь. Другое время. И странное место. Скажите, старец этот ваш, он сумасшедший хлечет. Это благословение на убийство приехало. Вот тебе не благословение. происходит необъяснимое. Остров. Окей. Okay. So that is the trailer to the film. Now, if you guys were able to read those uh, subtitles, then you probably caught a little bit of it. But it is a 2006 Russian film about a fictional 20th century Eastern Orthodox monk. And the film closed the 2006 Venice Film Festival, proved to be a moderate box office success, and won both the Nika Award and the China TV Golden Eagle Award as the best Russian film of 2006. The filming location was the city of Kim in Karelia, again, I'm not familiar, on the shores of the White Sea. It received generally positive reviews from critics. And so what is the plot of this film? Well, it begins with a Nazi vessel uh, coming up and actually taking over what appears to be just a Russian tugboat filled with coal. There's coal all over this tugboat. But here's, here's the, how it, the movies describe the plot. That during World War II, the sailor Anatoly and his captain Tikhon are captured by the Germans when they are board their barge and tugboat which is carrying a shipment of coal, and coal plays a very important role throughout this film. The German officer leading the raid offers Anatoly, who is terrified of dying, and you can tell he's, he's very cowardice, and he has this cough. This is actually how the Nazis find him. He hides in the coal, right, on this tugboat. He's hiding in the coal. Uh, the Nazis are searching the ship. They told him, find who's on the ship. They're looking for the captain and this Anatoly, the, the gentleman who's actually... Uh, fueling the ship by, again, uh, shoveling coal into the furnace, they hide inside these big piles of coal. But because Anatoly has this terrible cough, which actually he has throughout the entire film, the Nazis find him. They ask him, Where the, where's the captain? Where's the captain? He pretends he doesn't know. He doesn't know German. And then once they're getting ready to actually kill him, he gives him up. And so Anatoly, who is terrified of dying... The choice is to be shot or to shoot his captain, Tikhon, and stay alive. Of which Anatoly takes the gun and he shoots and Tikhon falls overboard. The Germans blow up the ship, but Anatoly is found by Russian Orthodox monks on the shore the next morning, who survives and becomes a stoker at the monastery, but is perpetually overcome with guilt. Thirty years pass. Anatoly now has the gifts of prophecy and healing. But the other monks do not really understand him. People come to see Anatoly for cures and guidance. But even now, he remains in a perpetual state of repentance. He often gets in a boat 
and goes to an uninhabited island where he prays for mercy and forgiveness and for Tikon's soul. Many years pass, and an admiral of the North Fleet arrives at the monastery. He brings his daughter, who is possessed by a demon, and Anatoly exercises it. The admiral turns out to be Tikon. And it is revealed that Anatoly only wounded him in the arm. Tikon forgives Anatoly. Anatoly announces his death. By Wednesday, the monks provide a coffin dressed with a white garment such as Jesus wore as an Orthodox baptismal garment. He lies in the coffin wearing a crucifix. Monks, one carrying a large cross representing the risen Christ, are seen rowing the coffin away from the island. That's the end of the movie. And so what's the spiritual message of this movie? The film is focused on Father Anatoly, repentance of his sin, therefore the virtually continuous occurrence of the Jesus prayer. Again, that's what I was saying. The Jesus prayer plays a very prominent role in this movie. But the transgressions of the depicted character, a fool of Christ, and again, we're going to unpack what a fool for Christ is here in a little bit, and their impact on the others are the means by which the actual plot develops. The film's director, Pavel Lungen, speaking of the central character's self-awareness, said he doesn't regard him as being clever or spiritual, but blessed in the sense that he is an exposed nerve which connects to the pains of this world. His absolute power is a reaction to the pain of those people who come to it, while typically when the miracle happens, they lay people asking for a miracle are always dissatisfied because the world does not tolerate domestic miracles. Screenwriter uh, Dimitri further explains, when a person asks God for something, he is often wrong because God has a better understanding of what a person needs at that moment. Uh, Peter Mamanov, who plays the lead character, formerly one of the few rock musicians in the USSR, converted to Eastern Orthodoxy in the 1990s and lives now in an isolated village. Pavel Lungin said about him that to a large extent he played himself. Mamanov received a blessing from his confessor for playing the character. The former patriarch of Moscow, uh, who held the office from 1990 to 2008, praised uh, the island for its profound depiction of faith and monastic life, calling it a vivid example of an effort to take a Christian approach to culture. And so I want to talk to you guys then about some of the important things that happen as we, you know, in this film and how it progresses. So again, if you haven't watched this film, I do recommend it. It's a great Orthodox film, has a great message. It's Riveting. You'll it, again. It takes a while for you to connect the dots as it, as the movie moves forward in the beginning, but it starts out as I told you at this Russian tugboat and Anatoly, this scared young skinny guy, it shows him shoveling coal into the furnace of this tugboat, where he goes back up to the captain's seat where the captain is driving the tugboat, and the next thing they know, they see a Nazi ship approaching them, and as the Nazi ships approach, they immediately hide. They run, they know what's getting ready to happen, and, and it turns out that they try to hide in these piles of coal, that this tugboat is, is moving these piles of coal, black gold, right? And they dive into it, as I mentioned, and the Nazis looking for him eventually discover Anatoly because of his cough. They pull him out of the coals, and they ask him, where is your captain? Where is your captain? He pretends he doesn't know, and then the captain, he goes, once, he, once they put the gun, they, lock, they load the gun, well, Anatoly, scared to die, goes and grabs the captain in the other side of the coal mountain, or this mound of coal, pulls him out, and now it's them two in front of all these Nazis. And he's begging, he's, he, Anatoly's grabbing the legs of the Nazis, asking, don't kill me, don't kill me, terrified of death, terrified of death. And this is going to plague Anatoly through the rest of the film, because it isn't until... Well, let me finish here. So Anatoly pleading for pleading to not to die, right? The Nazis have them up against the wall of the ship. And he says, well, why don't you be a man? And hands a gun to Anatoly with one bullet in it and tells him to shoot his captain. And the captain, you can tell, has this very alpha mentality. He's aware that he's probably going to die. And what does he do? He takes a cigarette out, lights it, and starts smoking and looking the Nazis right in their face. But Anatoly, this terrified, skinny, frail guy, what does he do? 
he accepts the offer. He takes the gun and he says he doesn't want to. He's, he's telling him, I'm sorry. He shoots his captain and the captain falls overboard of the ship. Now, unbeknownst to Anatoly, the Nazis went ahead and laid landmines on this tugboat, knowing that it was going to blow up. So it's not like they were going to allow him to live anyways. He just shot his captain for no reason. They're going to kill both of them anyways. But he shoots his captain. And then he yells. He, 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 after the Nazis leave, he thinks that he's won and that uh, you know he's the victor. And then the landmines go off. The ship blows up, and he's off out of sea. He's in the water. And the next scene is him laying on a sort of, again, very cold water. This is, in, this is uh, near the Arctic. And Russian monks find him, and they drag him back to the island where this monastery is. And while he's on the island, again, you don't, it kind of jumps forward again 30 years so you don't realize it. But now Anatoly is a priest, and he's a monk at this monastery, and he's doing the same exact thing that he was doing before, shoveling coal into the furnace to, to warm the monastery, to warm the pipes, you know, to keep all the houses uh, warm through the winter. Because, again, you can tell that they're up near the Arctic. And so this weak underling shoots his captain, right? This guy, he's, he's full of weakness. And the underling is rescued by the Orthodox monks. And the next thing you see is all these women outside this uh, fairly decrepit home. I mean, it's wooden. It's, it's, it's a small little shack, basically. And again, this is where the furnace is. This is where the boiler room is. This is where he's shoveling coal all day long. And... This girl, the first one who, who's come, is asking to see Father Anatoly. She wants to see Father Anatoly. She needs his blessing. She needs his blessing. And this is a thing that happens over and over and over, is that Father Anatoly never reveals that he is Father Anatoly. So they come to his shack looking for a blessing. And, and I'll explain. Different people come from different reasons. And he, he never just outright says, well, that's who I am. He always misleads them, saying that, oh, well, he's sleeping right now, or he can't be bothered right now. And this first woman who comes up, it's, it's a younger woman, you can tell, and, and she's pleading to see Father Anatoly. He keeps telling people, oh, he's busy right now, he's sleeping, he hasn't got out of bed yet. Meanwhile, he, Aunt Father Anatoly, is going and mining coal and bringing it back to the boiler room. And then she stops him, and she says, Father, you know, I need to see Father Anatoly, and Again, now we see that this man, this weak guy who was on this ship, who shot his captain, who was terrified of death, it's your first inkling that he has some type of spiritual gift. And he looks this girl in the eye, and she's, getting, she's clearly crying, and he says, what do you want, a blessing for your abortion? And it turns out that's exactly what she wanted. She was coming to get a blessing from the priest for an abortion because she was pregnant, and she was scared to death that nobody would marry her if she had a child, because clearly this child was going to be out of wedlock. This child was not going to have a father. And so um, he basically says, what do, you, what do you want me to do? You want me to get the priest to bless you so we can all go to hell? You, you, you're a murderer. And she falls to her knees. I mean, she's scared. She's obviously uh, extremely sad for what she's asking, but she's terrified she's not going to get married. And he looks her in the eyes and says, you're not going to get married anyways. But you better have this child because you're going to have the, the, cutest, uh, the, the cutest little boy and basically he's going to bring meaning to your life. And that your life's going to be better by having this child than killing this child. And even if you did get married, having that way on your soul for the rest of your life. Because, again, he believes that he's killed his captain. This is, this is this interior spiritual battle that Anatoly is dealing with throughout the entire film that he shot his captain when he was much younger. He was rescued by these monks. He's living at this monastery. He becomes this, this priest, this monk, with these incredible gifts of healing, of prophecy, of clairvoyance. And so um, that is the, that's the first, the first miracle or whatever. Is Obviously, he, he, can, he, t he can tell the, the gender, in, gender of her baby, uh, knew what she was coming for. And, but at the same time, you're not sure if he's just crazy or if he really has these gifts, right? The, the film kind of keeps you guessing because he acts in very erratic ways. He, he acts in what appears to be very irrational ways. And you don't know, is he crazy? 
because you can tell some of the other monks on the monastery don't exactly see him as the most uh, favorable character, to say the least. And so the underling, <coughs> Father Anatoly, now a monk, you can see that he goes, he, he, he gets in this little boat by himself, and he paddles almost every day to this little bitty island away from the island, and he prays for Tikhon. He prays for his captain. He asks for repentance over and over and over. And throughout the film, you see him always saying the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, please have mercy on me, a sinner. And you begin then to connect the dots. So this is probably about 20 minutes, 30 minutes into the film. You connect the dots that, oh, this Father Anatoly is this young guy that was on the ship, and he's repenting for killing his captain. <clears throat> and so you still see the, the scooping of coal. This guy is, is like religious in regards to scooping coal. And he doesn't want to leave the island. So now the next person that comes to him is a widow. This widow approaches Father Anatoly and she brings him food. And again, he's in the boiler room and he's just shoveling coal into the furnace. And she says, Father, I, I, again, I, I need to speak to Father Anatoly. Father Anatoly has this incredible uh, aura or, or this legacy around him that people can come and they can be healed. Again, on the island, in the monastery, he's considered this weird dude. He, he's kind of crazy. You know, you can't really trust him. Yet, all these people keep coming to the island to be healed by him. That there, again, this legend of his abilities spreads. So, the widow comes to him with a, a basket full of food and says, Father, I need to talk to Father Anatoly. I keep having these dreams that my ex-husband is... Uh, it, it, that, that his soul isn't at rest. He had to go to war, and um, he died. That's what she says. And so Father Anatoly asked her, you know, um, and she a little bit more questions about her her former husband, and she says, well, you know, we were only we were we were, we were in love. We were only able to live together for half a year before he was called to war. Before he was called to the army, and he went to war. Again, this is after World War II. He went to war, and I haven't seen him again. And that was 30 years ago. And this woman, then you see how devout she was to her husband. For 30 years, she has been mourning the man that she married and was only able to live with for six months. And he said, well, that, you know, he makes some type of comment again. I'm not exactly sure how he phrases it, but talks about how uh, that is a special kind of love. That is a special kind of love. And so what does Father Anatoly do? He says, okay, I'll go talk to Father Anatoly. So again, talking about himself in third person, he tells her, just stand, stand here in the doorway. Uh, and I'm going to go talk to him. And I'm going to leave the door ajar. And as I leave the door ajar, listen in, as intently as you can. And you'll be able to hear what he tells me. And so he goes into this other room. He leaves the door ajar. And he's talking to himself. So he plays this game where he's this father and he's going to Father Anatoly and saying, Father, this widow has come. She, she's asking for blessings for her, for her dead husband. And then again, playing himself, he, he's, oh, well, tell her she, she gets no blessings for the living. And the message that he gives her is that her husband is still alive. He's been very wounded. He was taken as a prisoner. And he's living in France, and he's, and he's wishing to be with her as much as she wishes to be back with him. And he tells her, go to France immediately. Go to France. And she's saying, Father, uh, and she's startled, right? She's believed that her husband has been dead for 30 years, and this priest is now telling her, no, your husband's alive. He's been a prisoner of war. He's now living in France, and he wishes to see you again is go see him. He's getting ready to die. Make sure that your hands are the ones that close his eyelids. And she, she starts crying. I mean, she can't believe it. You can see that she's confounded. And she says, Father, well, what am I going to do? I, 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 you know, I, I, that, France is a capitalistic country. They're not going to let me in. And he says, do, do what the Father said. If Father Anatoly said to go to France, you'll be able to get to France. And she says, but, but what about my farm? What about my cows? What about my hogs? And he tells her to sell everything. And she's just stunned. 
She's stunned, right? I mean, again, for the last 30 years, she's been living this life. And this guy who she was coming to just get a prayer, she just wanted a prayer because the fact that her ex-husband, or not ex, I mean her widowed husband, kept appearing in her dream, she thought it was a sign that he was, his soul was in a bad place, that, that she wanted prayer. So maybe, maybe the Lord would accept him into his kingdom. And now she's finding out he's alive, that he wants to see her, that he's about to die, and the father's telling her to get to France immediately so she can be the one to close his eyelids. But she has to sell everything she owns. And so she's crying and terrified, and she eventually ends up leaving. But again, as you're watching the movie, you're not sure, like, is this guy just making it up? Does he really have these power? Like, you, you can't tell. The, the, the film leaves you guessing. And so the next, the next person that comes is a mother, and she brings her crippled son. She has this, uh, this young boy. I, I would guess he'd probably be around, I don't know, seven to nine years old. He's walking with crutches. He can't really walk. They, according to his mother, he fell from a shed, a shed roof. And when he fell from the shed, he, he, he messed up his leg. And his hip and his leg are now wounded. And his hip is decaying. And again, this, this is a young boy, and it's his only getting worse and worse and worse. And she says, I've taken him to Moscow, and they've done four surgeries, and nothing is helping. Please help us. Um, and so she, again, comes to Father Anatoly, uh, not knowing you know, if he is Father Anatoly or not. I think this one, he actually rec- he, he goes by that name. And so what does he do? He brings in this homemade icon of Christ, it appears, that, that maybe he made. And this is, the, this is the icon that it shows him praying to. And he goes in, uh, grabs that icon, comes back into the boiler room, filled with coal everywhere. There's a furnace right there. And he places Christ's icon in the window seal. And he tells the woman and the son that what I'm getting ready to do is we're getting ready to pray to God. And I'm going to ask this little boy that at a certain time, I want you to speak to God as sincerely as possible. And ask him to heal your leg. And so that's what they do. He, he goes through this prayer. The young boy, it's time for him. And, and you can tell he's crying. He, he's asking the Lord, please help me. Please help me. Help, help my leg. I just want to walk again. I just want to be a normal boy. And the, father, the mother, again, it's just a mother and her son. She's, she's bawling her eyes out. Uh, Father Anatoly ends the prayer and asks the boy to walk. And he can walk a little bit, right? Again, he still has quite the limp and everything, but he goes to get back his crutches again because he, he's been walking on crutches for, for a couple years now. And Father Anatoly says, no, you don't need these anymore. And, and basically tells him to stop walking with the crutches. You're going to have to start walking on your own. And he, he says, this, this healing will be complete tomorrow morning after divine liturgy when, when uh, the, the superior, the, the, the supervisor, the, the head priest of the monastery gives communion. And that when the young boy takes the Eucharist, then you guys can leave and he'll be fully healed. And the mom tells him, hey, I got to work. I, ha- I have to work. We have, to, we, we have a ticket on the next boat. I have to go right now. I just came here to get these prayers. I wanted you guys to heal my son, but I have to go back to work. And you can see Father Anatoly is absolutely uh, annoyed, annoyed to say the least, the fact that that is her main concern, that she's coming there to heal her son. And yet now after this prayer, the father's telling her what, what, to finish this healing. Again, the boy needs communion. He has to take the body and blood. And she's not willing to stay because she wants to get back to work. And again, you can understand her frustration. I mean, again, in our worldly sense, our worldly sense is that, um, you know, how, how else is she going to pay the rent? How else is she going to provide for her son? And so she then, you, you, the scene ends with her on a boat with her son with a few other women leaving the island and what father anatoly does is he runs out into this ice cold water and grabs her son from her and carries him back to the island and she's bawling her eyes out she doesn't know what's going on and he takes her he takes the boy up to the uh some of the other monks and and tells them that this you know this boy needs communion tomorrow and then he drops him off and basically walks away. And so that scene ends with the woman uh, talking to the other monk who's holding now her son. 
and telling her, telling him that she has to work. And so then she come, runs up to Father Anatoly and he tells her, look, the pipes burst at your work. Nobody's going to be there for the next three days. It'll be fine. And again, you don't know, is this guy just making this stuff up? Or can he really like see in the future? Does he really have, is he really this knowledgeable? Does he know what's going on? You don't really know. And so, uh, and so that, that scene ends. And then throughout this film, one of the things I hadn't covered is that there's this other monk. And he's very good looking. He's tall. He has this deep voice. He has this great beard. He dresses very nice. And he's Father Job. Father Job. And Father Job is not a big fan of Father Anatoly. And even there's one scene where Father Job's coming to see Father Anatoly and tell him that the head priest um, said, told him that he can come stay with him so he, he can get over this cough, his sickness, right? Again, this guy lives around all this coal in the boiler room. He sleeps in the boiler room. And again, he's always coughing because he's surrounded by coal. And before Father Job gets there, Father Anatoly wipes all this soot all over the handle. So when he goes to grab the handle to come in, again, this man who's so nicely dressed, uh, who's very aesthetic in multiple ways, um, is, is then covered in soot. And this is one of these jokes, the, the, again, this sort of trickster behavior we see from Father Anatoly as, as the fool for Christ figure in this movie. And they go back and forth. But one of the things, then you're, you're not sure what's going on here, but Father Anatoly asks him, why did Cain kill Abel? Now, the answer to that is obviously jealousy. Jealousy that, a, that Abel had praise, had favor in the eyes of God. Cain was jealous of that. That's why he killed his brother. And so what really annoys Father Job is that Father Anatoly keeps saying this to him, insinuating that Father Job is jealous of Father Anatoly. Again, this guy who everybody else thinks is crazy. And he thinks he's crazy. And he's filthy dirty. And he's always coughing. He's always sick. He's always doing weird things. When they go to liturgy, he's turning the wrong direction. You're supposed to face the icons when you bow. But Father Anatoly turns around and he'll just face the, he'll just face the wall. And then the, the monks will come and they'll turn him, face him towards, again, the altar, towards the icons. And then he'll just turn around and start bowing and crossing himself and prostrating towards the wall. Again, people think, well, what is this dude's problem? He's really weird. So um, that's kind of going on in the background. And so then one of these times at liturgy, all of a sudden the house, the main cabin, if you will, the main shack where the, the head priest lives, gets caught on fire. And previous to this, the main priest came to come talk to Father Anatoly. And what does he do? He takes a charred log. He gets a piece of wood. He chars it. Again, in the movie, you don't know what the heck he's doing. He's always doing weird things. He chars this log, and then he's sitting up by the bell tower. And when the head priest starts walking towards him, he wants to talk to him. He throws down this charred log. Again, then the head priest doesn't really get why he's doing it. He thinks he's weird. He thinks he's a bit eccentric, if you will. But he's giving him, again, he has these, um, this premonition, right? That Father Anatoly knew that his cabin was going to burn down. And that's why, again, that, but you find this out later, but that's why he's then hitting him with this, uh, this charred log that, again, doesn't make any sense. And then while they're in liturgy, his house begins to burn his little shack that where the head priest begins to burn down and you can see he's very irritated with father anatoly that if if it was going to burn down why don't you just tell me why don't, did you have something to do with this and he's claiming that he knows nothing that only, only god knows who burned it down or why it burned down and it turns out it wasn't father anatoly but what happened is another monk at the monastery had was trying to light a lantern fill a lantern with fuel and he dropped it and when he dropped it again the lighter fluid and the lantern caught the whole place on fire so the head priest now and this is where a very interesting part of the movie <coughs> um that the head priest comes to stay with father anatoly so this this head priest and, and at one point it shows you the inside of his home or his little shack again that he's living in, in on, inside the monastery and he has pieces of art it's very again it's very beautiful you can tell it's very orderly it's very aesthetic um, it's very clean the exact opposite of father anatoly 
And so now his home is burned down. And while it's being rebuilt, he says, oh, I'm going to stay with you. You, don't, you wouldn't mind that, would you, Father? Uh, the head priest asking Father Anatoly. And he says, no, not at all. And he asks him, well, where? And, and he's bringing this real thick, it almost looks like a comforter. It's a huge blanket, real thick blanket. And he's carrying it into his home. And he asks, uh, Father Anatoly, you know, where, where do you sleep? You know, he's in the boiler room with him. Where do you sleep? I'm going to sleep with you uh, while my place is being built. And he points to the coal. He sleeps on the coal. He sleeps right there in the boiler room. He doesn't have a bed. He literally lays his head on the coal, the same thing that's making him sick. Um, and so the priest says, oh, okay, well, then I guess I'll do the same. So he lays down his blanket on the coal, and he tries to, uh, tries to sleep with, with uh, Father Anatoly there. Now, uh, I think a few, a few nights go by, and the head priest there, he has these very nice boots, these very soft leather boots that he said he was gifted by one of the Metropolitans, and, and that this beautiful blanket, this thick comforter that he sleeps on, on top of these, the coals now, he says, well, I got that from Mount Athos. Again, going with other priests there, uh, that it was, it was gifted to me. And Father Anatoly, okay, shakes his head. And then the head priest, one night, goes to bed. He takes his boots off. He's laying on this blanket. And he wakes up halfway through the night, and he sees Father Anatoly leaning up against the, uh, the, the boiler or the, the furnace in the boiler room there and asks him, well, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm just reading the sins. And he, again, he, he just woke up. He's kind of looking at him. And he realized that what he had done is he had cut the top of his boots off. And he was just looking at the inside of his boots. There wasn't really anything there. There was no words that he was actually reading. That he was burning the head priest's boots. And then the head priest you know, says, what are you doing? Because you know, he has bad feet. The reason why he was gifted those particular boots is so he could walk because his feet are so sensitive. <clears throat> and um, the, uh, what happens is... He's extremely upset with Father Anatoly, and Father Anatoly then turn, closes the vents, turns up the boiler, and just makes the room filled with smoke. He says, oh, uh, you know, Father, we got demons in here. We got to smoke out the demons. And the, the head priest, the abbot, he's literally about to choke to death, and he thinks, and, he, and Father Anatoly's locked the door so he can't get out. And he, again, he's freaking out. He thinks this guy's going to kill him. And uh, um, eventually he stops, again, after he's burned everything, and he says, there's one more demon, Father, there's one more demon. He breaks the lock, he opens the door, and he takes the head priest's comforter, this blanket, he takes it out, and he starts wrestling with it, and then he throws it into the sea. And you can see that this head priest, I mean, these were gifts given to him, right? And you almost feel bad for him. You're like, what is this crazy guy doing? And then after a while, the, uh, the head priest there, he, he, again, he, he's basically in tears. And he thanks Father Anatoly. He thanks him because he realizes his attachment to these things. This whole, this whole charade where Father Anatoly is attacking all these demons. He had to kill all these demons. It was his own attachment. His own attachment to these, these very nice boots. His own attachment to this incredibly nice blanket. And... This was preventing, again, then the head priest of this monastery, Father Anatoly, the one that's crazy, the fool for Christ, highlights his own worldly attachment. And, and the head priest realizes this. And uh, he's brought to tears. And he says, you know, my sins are great and my virtues are few. And, uh, and he thanks Father Anatoly for freeing him from his attachments, from burning his boots and casting his favorite blanket that was gifted to him on Mount Athos into the sea. And, um, and that, that was a really powerful, powerful scene. And Father Falaret, that's the name of this head priest, again, thanks him for from freeing him from all his worldly attachments. And then this ends with the culmination of, you see this very, um, you see this very well put together man. And he has this daughter, and she's, again, dressed very nice. They're on a train, 
And you can tell there's something off about this woman, about this girl. And this man, you can tell he's very concerned about his daughter. You don't know what exactly is going on. But it becomes clear, eventually, they get to the island. That they were on the ship, they were on a train, and they took a boat to get to the island, to get to this monastery, because they heard this guy named Father Anatoly, he can heal mad people, he can heal insane people, and that's what he thinks is wrong with his daughter. He thinks that she's mentally ill, that, that she has some type of disease. And again, he said, I've taken her to all the hospitals, I've taken her all through Moscow, nobody can help her, please. And... Father Anatoly soon realizes when he looks at him that this is Tikhon. This is the captain of the tugboat that he had shot when he was a young man who he thought he killed. Turns out he didn't kill him. That the captain of that tugboat became a admirable, an admiral in the Navy. And the, the North Navy is what they called it, I guess. Um, and uh, his daughter was certainly crazy. I mean, at one point on, on their way there, they're in, they're in a rowboat. A, a monk had gone and got, got them from the ship, you know, to get to the island. They're all in a rowboat, and Father Anatoly starts crowing like a rooster. And then she, this, his daughter, Tikhon, again, the, the Navy Admiral, his daughter, she starts crowing back. You're like, what is going on with these people? And Father Anatoly starts clucking around like a chicken. And... The abbot, Father Falaret, he says, you know, stop that. What are you doing? And um, eventually they get to the island. Eventually the woman runs up to Father Anatoly, and he looks in her eyes. He realizes what's going on. Then Tikhon comes to him, and he says, uh, you know, she, she, he's claiming that she has all these mental illnesses. He says, well, she's, she's possessed. She doesn't have an illness. She has a demon. And he claims that he's very familiar with this demon and that he can help her. And Tikhon is really annoyed by this. He, again, he doesn't believe in any of this stuff, even though he's there at the monastery. He's there for the healing. But when Father Anatoly says, your daughter's possessed, he's ready to go. He's ready to pack his bags. Let's get back on the boat and get out of here. And yet the possessed woman follows Father Anatoly everywhere. And so they're clucking like chickens. She gets into the boat. And then they go to the island where he always goes to pray for Tikhon, right? So you see this full circle, that the same little island that he goes to, to, again, say the Jesus prayer over and over and over, to pray for the man's soul who he believes that he killed, he's now taking that same man's daughter and he's freeing her from her demons. And this is really powerful because what it shows, again, is this journey of Father Anatoly that he, was, he, was so, he lacked so much courage. He couldn't face evil, right? When the Nazis were there in front of him, when they were threatening him with death, he couldn't face it. He begged for mercy. He was willing to kill his own friend and captain. And now he's the only one that can face the evil inside this guy's daughter. And so, again, you see this journey. That as Father Anatoly got closer to Christ, he became more courageous. That he was able to face evil, where before he wasn't. He was willing to do evil to get away from evil. Which again is, is a sort of, that's the, that's the barter the devil always gives us, right? And so, um, this eventually he exercises the demon out of this young woman. They go back to the main island where the monastery is, and uh, he asked Tikhon to have a private conversation with him, and that's when he reveals to him he was the man who shot him and thought he died, and he asked for his forgiveness. And when Tikhon gave him his forgiveness, Father Anatoly was ready to die, that he, he could now go and face God. And that's what was preventing him the whole time, is that he wasn't afraid to die. He was afraid of God's judgment. He, in that sin, what, that perceived sin, that he had killed that man long ago, it weighed on him over and over and over. And then eventually Father Anatoly reposes, but right before that priest that he was always getting into it with, Father Job, they make up. Father Job spends incredible amount of time to make him a beautiful wooden coffin. And 
Father Anatoly told him he didn't want this coffin. He just want he just want a, a quick box. He doesn't need something this fancy. He doesn't need furniture, as he said. He needs just something to die in. And then uh, Father Job showing more humility, more humility, says, "What do you want me to do? Cover it in coal? I'll do anything. I'll take off all the tarnish." And that's again his humility forced then Father Anatoly to become more humble. And then he apologizes, and then they both embrace each other. And you see this full, um, again, coming back full circle. And Father Job and Father Anatoly reconcile their differences. And now Father Anatoly is ready to die. And he tells him, go tell the abbot, go tell the head priest, go tell Father Phileret that I passed away. And so Father Job leaves. Father Anatoly is in the coffin. And Father Job goes and rings the bells and, and Father Anatoly dies right there. And so that's the whole movie. It's, that's the whole movie, and it's very, very interesting. But what are some of the major takeaways that I want to talk about? Well, God's providence. God's providence. Unlikely messengers. It's, very, it's the unlikeliness that the man who thought, again, he thought he killed somebody, that God was using him to perform all these miracles, that God was using him for having premonitions and clairvoyance. It was God was using him to be able to heal the young boy with the, with the lame leg and the, and the uh, decaying hip. That f- God used him to tell the woman that his hu- her husband is still alive. The man that you still love, that you haven't seen for 30 years, he's still alive. So the unlikely messenger is a, is a very big takeaway and something that we can all think about in our lives. And, and again, this even relates, relates to me and what I wanted to highlight with some of my own struggles, again, with this YouTube channel, is uh, my brand, if I have a brand, right, again, because the business thing, it's not to be overly pious. It's not to, to present myself as more righteous than anybody. It's more just about... Um, Information, right? I, I try to have every every stream is deep, dense with information, and, and that's what I want. I want to over deliver, right? But when people message me about watching Jay Dyer or myself and how they've changed their lives, or or they are now inside the church, or they've given up on their addiction, and I get all these adulations, that it weighs on me it, in a real way. Um, that it, it's like this paradox. The paradox is I spend so much effort for each stream that I want every stream that I do on this YouTube, I want it to be good. I want it to be high quality. I want it to be impactful. I want it to be dense. And yet at the same time, when people begin to give me adulation for it, it's almost like a burden because I know the sins that I commit. I know the struggles that I have. And for example, one gentleman and I'm not going to share any names, but he, uh, he sent me this in, uh, very generous support, and then he sent me this long message about how he had been watching my content, he was deep into the psychedelics and stuff like that, and he was now becoming orthodox, and he was able to quit all these different substances. He was able to quit all these different d- degenerate behaviors in his life. He, was, he gave up pornography. He, he's no longer, again, he hadn't had sex in a while. He uh, was no longer ingesting any type of substance. And he was giving me, I, you know, I don't know, some type of credit for this. And I had to talk to my priest about it because it weighed on me. Because how, again, this is the unlikeliness of God's messengers, is that how does somebody give me all this, at, you know, this credit when I'm struggling with those same things, when I haven't been able to quit all those things? That I'm sitting here and I'm, and before every stream, I pray. I always pray. And some of the people that I've streamed with know that I've asked them to pray with me before I go on, but others I haven't. But every stream, I try to make sure that it's God's that I can be a conduit and a tool for his will, and that I don't lead anybody astray. I don't move anybody away from God, but if I do anything, I bring them towards God. And so it's like, I know that it's not me. The paradox of this whole YouTube channel, it's like, I try so damn hard. But then when I get the adulation, it makes me feel 
like burden. It, it makes me feel like how, how, how am I doing that? That's not me. You know, that's the Lord. And then it's like, then the realness of all this stuff, like this stuff is so real. What we're talking about is so real. We're talking about God incarnate. It's real. And the power of all this stuff is so real that uh, sometimes it's hard to deal with. And yet, and yet at the same time, you put in so much work that that's what you do it for. So it's this weird feedback loop. That's this paradox I was trying to talk about. That Again, I feel like I witness. Now, I'm not trying to equate myself to Father Anatoly or the movie or anything like that. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to highlight unlikely messengers. All the sins that I've committed, all the drugs I've taken, all the sex, all the degenerate activities that I've been participant in. Um, and yet, I get emails like that from people. It doesn't make sense. So, the feelings of unworthiness, the 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 and, and and what's so, and then you know, for me, before I before I go to bed every night, I pray. Um, uh, the opportunity, it's like again this paradox because I know that I'm on my purpose. I know that I'm in the exact place God wants me to be. I feel so fulfilled. I feel so thankful that I can come on here and I can do these streams and people want to donate, people want to be a part of it, people support it, um, you know, that I just need time to grow it. I just need time to grow this thing. And I'm so, so thankful. And I put so much effort into it. And so it's like this weird, again, this paradox of like I try so hard, I know I'm in the right place, I'm struggling in my own life, in my own spirituality, and yet, at the same time, I know God's working through all this stuff. And it's like really heavy. And so, uh, part of that God's providence part is like allowing God's timing. Allowing God's timing to work. And that's another part, again, in my own spiritual journey that I've kind of turned a corner in. Um, that... I was talking to uh, Allison. She's in our community, and, I, and uh, we were speaking privately, and I just feel closer to God than ever before. Uh, and it's like the more I struggle with things, the more I fight against them, the more I struggle, it's like um, you get, obviously you get closer to God, but the blessings, I feel like I, I, I just, all this intellectual, it was all intellect that brought me to orthodoxy. And it's like, especially in the last month, it's been such a transformation of heart. Transformation of heart. You can't really explain that to people. Um, and so, part of that transformation of heart is letting go and I try to talk to you guys about finding your purpose and working your butt off and that is what's given me a sense of peace and, and, and allowing God's timing to work that you just you just work you just do the things that you know you need to do you need to pray you, you need to fight your temptations you, you need to build that relationship with God um, and you just need to work on whatever your purpose is and so it's funny how things begin to fall into place. And that's what I'm witnessing in my own life. And it's, it's like it's it just, it's a new state. It's a new place in my, uh, in my spiritual journey. And so now I want to talk to you guys quickly about being a fool for Christ. Because that is what Father Anatoly is in this film. And in a way... We're all fools for Christ just by trying to be orthodox in the contemporary period. Um, that if I was speaking again with, a, with another gentleman, and we were talking about uh, not having sex, which is, again, very difficult, especially if you engage in those activities previously, and you engaged in, you know, you've developed bad relationships with them or whatnot. But, you know, I do not want who... 
when I, the, the woman that I'm going to marry, I absolutely do not want to sleep with before marriage. I don't want that. I want, I want to get married before God in a church, in an Orthodox church, in the Orthodox setting, in the traditional way. I want it to be done the right way. I just want to do it the right way. And I was talking to somebody who's, who is struggling with this in, in regards to he's in a relationship. They've been in a relationship for a while, and now he wants to uh, no longer participate in those activities until they get married. But he doesn't know how she's going to react to that because, again, she's not necessarily as into some of this Orthodox stuff. And I could so relate to it. I could so relate to that because it, it began to happen in my previous relationship um, that I was not as comfortable in engaging in all these activities that, <laughs> you know, you want to engage in. And you look like a weirdo. Like, again, in the 21st century, if you're a man... Um, and you have the opportunities, you have the availability, you have people that want to have sex with you, and you don't want to do that because you're conflicted by it, you look like a fool. And in a sense, all we're trying to do is just follow Christ, but we look like the fool. We are a sort of fool for Christ. Now, this is different than the archetype of the fool for Christ where you transgress normal boundaries. We're just trying to uphold normal boundaries. But in a society where all the boundaries have been transgressed, you look like the weirdo. You look like the weirdo for it. And so now I want to talk to you guys just quickly about the fool for Christ and that archetype and how it's like a Christianized trickster figure. And that the trickster figure, again, transgresses these boundaries in a tribal setting, for example, the trickster figure. And that's what the clown is. That's what a clown is. That's what the Joker, right, in Batman, uh, that's what the Joker is. He's a trickster figure. Right, He transgresses all the boundaries to highlight the problems within normal society. That's, uh, and then a clown. That's, a, a clown is just a, another version of the trickster figure. The, the, um, you know, the court joker, you know, when you think of like old, old kings uh, in their court and they'd have these jester figures. That's again, that's a trickster figure. And in a tribal setting, you know, the trickster figure is allowed to rule one day out of the year. He's allowed to rule one day out. So whoever leads the chief or whoever leads the tribe, the trickster, one day out of the year, he's able to go sit on his throne that nobody else can sit on. He's able to defecate on that guy's throne. He's able to, uh, you know, do lewd things. He's, he masturbates in front of everybody. He does all these weird things in front of people to transgress all the boundaries so then they can come back and reestablish the boundaries. Now, uh, I'm not saying, again, my point is that the Fool for Christ is a Christianized form. It's, it's a sort of Logos-oriented form of this type of behavior. And so the Fool for Christ refers to behavior such as giving up all one's worldly possessions upon joining a monastic order, or deliberately flouting society's conventions to serve religious purposes, particularly of Christianity. Such individuals have historically been known as both holy fools and blessed fools, the term fool connotes what is perceived to be feeble-mindedness, and blessed, or holy, refers to the innocence in the eyes of God. The term fools for Christ derives from the writings of St. Paul. Desert fathers and other saints acted the part of holy fools, as have the uh, um, other aspects of Eastern Orthodox asceticism. Fools for Christ often employ shocking and unconventional behavior to challenge accepted norms. They deliver prophecies or to mask, uh, to, de de uh, to mask their piety. And so uh, Basil, the fool for Christ, he's one, again, you can Google that one, Basil, fool for Christ, he he's another figure. Uh, certain prophets of the Old Testament who exhibited signs of strange behavior are considered by some scholars to be predecessors or prefigurings of the fools for Christ. The prophet Isaiah walked naked and barefoot for about three years, predict predicting a forthcoming captivity in Egypt. Again, often, that's not uncommon. The fool for Christ, for example, Basil, fool for Christ, he would pray naked and, and he walked naked i think both summer and winter for a long period of time and so the prophet ezekiel lay before a stone which symbolized uh beleaguered jerusalem and through and though god instructed him to eat baked or eat bread baked on human waste ultimately he asked to use cow dung instead 
Hosea married a harlot to symbolize the infidelity of Israel before God. By opinion of a certain scholars, these prophets were not counted as fools by their contemporaries as they just carried out separate actions to attract people's attention and to awake their repentance. According to Christian ideas, however, foolishness included consistent rejection of worldly cares and imitating Christ, who endured mockery and humiliation from the crowd. The spiritual meaning of foolishness from the early ages of Christianity was close to unacceptance of common social rules of hypocrisy, brutality, and thirst for power and gains. By the words of Anthony the Great, Here comes the time when people will behave like madmen, and if they see anybody who does not behave like that, they will rebel against him and say, You are mad because you are not like them. I'm sure most of us have probably heard that quote. Part of the biblical basis for it can be seen in the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10, which famously says, We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. And also, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us we are being saved. We are being saved. It is the power of God. For, uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. So we see, again, those who follow Christ will be perceived as fools to the world. And that's what Anatoly was. Anatoly, again, this what appeared to be a sort of madman on the island. He, in fact, was the one closest to God. He, in fact, was the one who was repenting the most. He was, in fact, the one who was trying to be the most like Christ. And so in Eastern Christianity, the holy fool is the Russian, or again, this is a Russian word, I can't pronounce it, is the Russian version of foolishness for Christ, a, a peculiar form of Eastern Orthodox asceticism. The your, I'll try to pronounce it, but again, if you guys know Russian, I apologize for butchering this word. The Eurodivy is a f- holy fool, which who acts intentionally foolish in the eyes of men. The term implies behavior which is caused neither by mistake nor by feeble-mindedness, but is deliberate, irritating, even provocative. In his book, Holy Fools in Byzantine and Beyond, Ivanov described holy fool as a term for a person who feigns insanity, pretends to be silly, or who provokes shock or outrage by his deliberate unruliness. He explained that such conduct qualifies as holy foolery only if the audience believes that the individual is sane, moral, and pious. The Eastern Orthodox Church holds that holy fools fools voluntarily take up the guise of insanity in order to conceal their perfection from the world and thus avoid praise. Ivanov argued that unlike in the past, modern, again, I'm butchering this word, Eurodivy are generally aware that they look pathetic in others' eyes. They strive to preempt this contempt through exaggerated self-humiliation, and following such displays, let it be known that their behaviors were staged and that their purpose was to disguise their superiority over their audience. Fools for Christ often given the title of blessed, which does not necessarily mean the individual is less than a saint, but rather points to the blessings from God, which they believe to have acquired. The Eastern Orthodox Church records Isidora uh, Berenkis of Egypt among the first holy fools. However, the term was not popularized until the coming of Simeon of Emesa, who is considered to be a patron saint of holy fools. In Greek, the term for holy fool is salos. The practice was recognized in the hagiography of the 5th century Byzantium, and it was extensively adopted in Russia, probably in the 14th century. 
The madness of the holy fool was ambiguous and could be real or simulated. He or she was believed to have been divinely inspired and was therefore able to say truths which others could not. Normally in the form of indirect allusions or parables, he had a particular status in regards to czars as a figure not subject to earthly control or judgment. The first reported fool for Christ in Russia was St. Procopius, who came from the lands of the Holy Roman Empire to Novgorod, Novgorod, then moved to Ustug, pretending to be a fool and leading an ascetic way of life. He slept naked on church porches, prayed throughout the whole night, and received food only from poor people. He was abused and beaten, but finally won respect and became venerated after his death. The Russian Orthodox Church numbers 30 holy fools among its saints, starting from Procopius and most prominently Basil the Fool for Christ, who gives his name to St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow. One of the, most, one of the best known modern examples in the Russian church is perhaps St. Exenia of St. Petersburg. And St. Xenia, I believe, this of St. Petersburg, she is the one that I had been praying to to find a spouse. And so if you're looking for a husband or a wife, I do recommend praying to St. Xenia. So crazy for God is an expression sometimes used in the United States and other English-speaking countries to convey a similar idea to foolishness for Christ. Um, so uh, the... So this Russian idea, the, the Eurydivi in art and literature, there are a number of references to the Eurydivi in the 19th century Russian literature. The holy fool Nikol Nikolika is a character in Pushkin's play uh, Boris Gundanov and, oh gosh, I'm terrible, Masorgitsky Mas opera based on the play the Pushkin, based on the play, the Pushkin's narrative poem, The Bronze Horseman, the character of Evgenly, is based in the tradition of the Holy Fools and its conf confrontation with the animated statue of Peter the Great. The Holy Fools appears several times in the novels of Dostoevsky. The idiot explores the ramifications of placing a holy fool, the compassionate and insightful epileptic prince, in a secular world dominated by vanity and desire. According to Joseph Frank, though the genuinely and well-educated prince bears no external resemblance to the eccentric figures, he does possess their traditional gift of spiritual insight, which operates instinctively below any level of conscious awareness or doctrinal commitment. In Demons, the mad, man, the mad woman Maria uh, Labidinka displays many of the attributes of the holy fool as does characters of Sophia or, or as Sophia in Crime and Punishment and uh, Liz, Lizvreta in The Brothers Kaz Kazimov. Another fool for Christ is Grisha in Tolstoy's Childhood, Boyhood, Youth. Callus and Dewey describe Grisha as follows. He was an awesome figure, immense... Uh, emaciated, barefoot and in rags, with eyes that looked right through you, and long shaggy hair. He always wore chains around his neck. Neighborhood children would sometimes run after him, laughing and calling out his name. Older persons, as a rule, viewed Grisha with respect and little fear, especially when he suffered one of his periodic seizures and began to shout and rant. At such times, adult bystanders would crowd around and listen, for they believed what the Holy Spirit was working through him. Grisha's abnormal social conduct, seizures, and rants were common behaviors amongst holy fools. The esteem, the esteem expressed by adults was also common. In his autobiography, Tolstoy expressed such esteem and reaction to overhearing Grisha praying, O oh, great Christian Grisha, your faith was so strong that you felt the nearness of God. Your love was so great that words flowed of their own, of from, <laughs> flowed of their own will from your lips, and you did not verify them by reason. And what high praise you gave to the majesty of God, when not finding any words, you prostrated yourself on the ground. And so that kind of sums up what I wanted to say about the holy fool again, which is a prominent archetype father anatoly plays in this movie 
And, but, and the last thing I want to say is the Jesus prayer, that uh, if you're not saying the Jesus prayer, I do recommend it. And I wanted to share before I hop off here, again, if you guys have any... Um, you guys have any super chats or what you would like to donate feel free to use the Streamlabs link if not that's that's fine too um but the jesus prayer i recently had an experience where i was uh really bothered by something it was a couple weeks ago i could not sleep it was i was just tossing and turning I was wide awake throughout the night. I could not sleep. I could not get this thing off my mind. It was making me angry. And I started to pray the Jesus prayer. And I just laid there and I probably just for an hour just said the Jesus prayer. And next thing I know, I woke up the next day and I felt so relieved. And I just was convinced that was like my first real experience of the power of the Jesus prayer that uh, this thing that was just ailing me, that I could not get over, that was annoying me, that was troubling me, that was causing my emotions to be out of control, that by just saying the Jesus prayer over and over and over and over, that all of a sudden, even the the situation never changed, but it no longer affected me. It was like, again, I I just moved where this thing was affected. I moved beyond it. And... um, yeah, again, that's an experiential, experiential anecdotal uh, little story there about the Jesus prayer. But if you're not using it, I do do recommend it. So uh, with that, I am going to hop off here because my uh, theology course is getting ready to start with the church. Again, guys, if you could smash that like. I hope you guys enjoyed this movie review. Uh, if you haven't seen The Island, I do recommend it. It's free. It's on YouTube. Uh, it's in 720. Just put in The Island Russian film and you'll see it pop up. It's about two hours long and it is really worth watching. It's a good film. I highly recommend it. I enjoyed it. Um, so, uh, yeah. Anyways, I will be back on Friday. Friday, I will have another stream. I think I'm debating, again, you guys can send me some topics. Send me some hot topics. That's what I'm looking for is what do you think would be some of the more popular uh, topics? I'm thinking one of the ones that I'm, I'm leaning towards is I want to do a stream on talking about why Terrence McKenna was wrong. Um, I want to I do all the new age. I'm going to do Dar- Terrence McKenna, Deepak Chopra, um, uh, Leo Gura. Uh, tons of these new age figures. You know, I've already done Alan Watts, but I'm going to start making that almost like a series here on the YouTube channel. But if you guys got some good suggestions for stream topics that you think will be very popular for a a wide audience, uh, please shoot them to me. I would greatly like, I would be greatly appreciated. I want to know, um, know what you guys think. And, uh, if you have some good ideas, if you think, hey, Patrick, this seems like a, a topic that'd be really popular. I think you'd be able to get some people that maybe aren't watching your content, you know, just clicking through, through the, through the algorithm and whatnot. Uh, you may be able to grab these people or even in the community. What would you guys, what would be the most, um, a topic that you would appreciate the most? Let me know. Put that in, put that in the uh, comment section. Let me know. I, I would greatly appreciate it. But With that being said, I am going to hop off here now and uh, go to my church theology course. So thank you all. Again, please smash that like. Uh, Let me know if you have any suggestions for future topic streams. Also, if you guys would be interested in becoming website members, please go uh, and sign up using this link right here. It's $5 a month. You get access to exclusive video content. I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. If you would also like to potentially set up a one-on-one session, you'd like to talk about theology, philosophy, or any topic that you wish, um, you can use this link here, and I would be more than willing and humble to sit with you and talk about whatever topic you'd be interested. So with that being said, I am now going to get out of here. Thank you all for being here. Again, please smash that like, and I will see you guys Friday. Friday, I'll be back with a new stream, and... Saturday, tentatively, Father Peter Hears will be here. So uh, make sure you join us Saturday with Father Peter Hears. So again, thank you guys. I will see you on the other side.